All right. John chapter 15. How many times we have gone over this? I started to redo it. <clears throat> Never got around to finishing it. I got up to verse 14. John 15, 1 to 8. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. There will be a, some figures of speech here, symbolism. <clears throat> he, God, cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Now don't conclude, they're going to hell because they're not doing some good works. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. So that it will be more faithful, even more faithful. So you got some Christians there, and God cuts some stuff of you off. Does that part of you go to hell? See, don't jump to conclusions. Wait. So, this is pruning me, putting me under stuff that I had to persevere through, suffering. And I've been, to my estimation, but there are people out there that aren't even believers, far worse off than I am. So I should be really ashamed of myself. <clears throat> but I've been ingrained to, like today, argued for the faith, had difficulty uh, getting older. I'm being pruned. Am I going to hell? I just gave a whole trolley, le a Bible lesson. <clears throat> One drunkard came in and told me I was a Pharisee. <clears throat> but I felt so much better because that's my purpose. As a believer, as an evangelist, <clears throat> guy asked me that I talk to. He's so excited to meet me, but the audience outside of him was hostile. I didn't even fear my life, although somebody could have gotten up and knifed me to death the way I was talking, because they don't like to hear about Jesus. Anyway, so I've been, I'm being pruned. I'm not going to hell. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So he's talking to the disciples. That's me. Now. I'm already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So I'm not going to hell. So what do those branches happen? Okay. Remain in me. So abide in me. And I will remain in you. <coughs> so. If you are faithful. Jesus will be faithful to you. Oh, you're not faithful. You don't remain in him. He'll leave you. You're kicking the Holy Spirit out. See, let's just keep reading. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. So you have to be acting as if you are in Christ. A positional truth, we are in Christ. At the moment of faith alone and Christ alone. But you have to act the part. See, there's the difference. Your positional truth keeps you heaven, heavenly. Matter of fact, in Ephesians 2 6, it, it says you're in the heavenlies. So, remain in me is relative to being fruitful. If you're not bearing fruit on the tree, you're like the branches that are cut off. You aren't being sent to hell. You're like the branches that are worthless branches that are put in a fire, but you aren't the ones that are put in the fire. It's your works, your misdeeds, <coughs> unfruitfulness, because we all do things. If it's unfruitful, and your whole life is unfruitful, then your whole life is like a branch that's cut off, thrown into the fire. If you're fruitful, then you get pruned back. I lose a hand or an arm. Maybe cut me off at the neck. See, don't bring this too far. So remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. 
it must remain in the vine. Be faithful to Christ through studying of the word. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So act like you're in Christ. Can you unremain in Christ? This is, now if we keep reading, if anyone does not remain in me, he's like, oh, the word like, a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. It doesn't say you are the branch that are cut off. The word like there, you like a branch that is worthless in the garden, in the orchard, not bearing any fruit. That branch is cut off from the tree. Okay, you like that branch, but you aren't the branch that suffers yourself personally. It's your works. If you remain in me and my words, oh, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given. Jesus' words, where are they? In the Bible. Be a good Bible student. Remain in Christ. How do you do that? Study the word and then follow the directions. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. <clears throat> no one's going to hell here. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Jesus is the one true vine through whom all fruit is born. So the disciples had a different understanding of the word vine from Old Testament Scripture. To, to them, the vine meant Israel. And in a sense, outside of the context of this verse, it does. Psalm 80, 8-9. You, Jehovah God, brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. Isaiah 5, 1 and 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, and he saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Similarity here, but not identity here. Jeremiah 2.21 I, God, had planted you, Israel, like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? Hosea 10.1 Israel was a spreading vine. He brought forth fruit for himself. As his fruit increased, he built more altars, and his land prospered, and he adorned his sacred stones. Old Testament scripture refers to Israel in the above passages as a vine. But our Lord, as it is recorded in the Gospel of John, is stating that he is the one true vine, as opposed to Israel, who is referred to in Old Testament scripture as a vine, but not the true vine from whom all things bear fruit. This to the Jew was a startling statement to hear. For the focus of the Old Testament-minded Jew, with respect to the symbolism of the word vine, was indeed the nation Israel. Our Lord, however, goes much deeper. He goes to the source of the fruit bearing to the one true vine through whom one bears fruit, the Messiah of the nation Israel and of the whole world, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The word translated as true, alphine, or genuine. So, we're dissecting this thing. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Second statement, and the father is the gardener who is intimately involved with his creation. My father is a gardener. In Old Testament scripture, God is spoken of as the owner of the vineyard of Israel. <clears throat> this is a concept from which the Jews held that God was a distant God who did not involve himself intimately with the day-to-day -day lives of his people, except at times to judge. But here our Lord is saying something new, that God is not only the owner of the vineyard, but he is a God who takes intimate and exacting care of his vineyard. And our Lord further says that God the Father himself is taking care of the vine, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> God the Father is the vine dresser, the husbandman, who, the Lord testifies, is intimately involved on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, caring for God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, while our Lord walked the face of the earth. And the Father is so intimately involved in caring for the Son, so he is also involved with caring for the believers. 
the branches of the living vine, as our Lord attests to in this passage. Dr. McGee says, through the Bible, he wrote a, a couple of uh, volumes there about through the Bible, his radio show. In the Old Testament, it is prophesied that the Lord Jesus would grow up before him as a tender plant, tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. Isaiah 11, 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So McGee goes on to say, Think how often the Father intervened to save Jesus from the devil, who wished to slay him. The Father is the one who cared for the vine, and he will care for the branches too. So, the subject of this passage now, verses 1 and 2. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So the subject of this passage is fruit bearing, not salvation. <clears throat> the scenario of a vineyard depicts fruit bearing. Dr. McGee brings out the key to this passage in John 15. The branches must be joined to the vine. For what purpose? For fruit bearing. I.e. the purpose discussed here in this passage is not salvation. Our Lord is speaking to his disciples, Peter, James, John, and so on. His own disciples, <coughs> who are born-again believers, with the exception of one Judas Iscariot, who no longer walked with Christ in the pretense of being a disciple. Jesus is speaking of to them on the subject of doing divine good works, of bearing fruit. He is not teaching on the subject of receiving or keeping one's eternal life in heaven. Let's keep in mind that we must not draw meaning from this parable unless our Lord does so himself. Instead, we are to discern only those relationships between individuals and activities in the vineyard to which our Lord refers, and only to in the specific ways in which he refers. The subject at hand that our Lord is speaking about is the bearing of fruit of his disciples, and by application, the bearing of fruit of all believers. Our Lord therefore speaks about the process that a husbandman, a caretaker of a vineyard, goes through in order to get the branches of the vine to produce fruit. He prunes the branches that bear fruit in order that they may bear more fruit. He cuts off the branches of the vine that aren't producing fruit at all. These branches which he has cut off, he throws away. These cut off branches wither and are thrown into a fire and burn. Keep in mind that this is the normal way a vine dresser tends to his vineyard in order to produce fruit. And all of this activity that our Lord is speaking about is relative to the producing of fruit in his disciples, born-again believers, secure in their eternal destiny with the Lord in heaven. Ephesians 1, 13-14. Let's read that to be sure. There she be, in him, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. Anything else? Nope, just believe. You are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, a deposit, guarantee of our inheritance, eternal inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, that be us, because we're in Christ to the praise of his glory. So, you believe. Then you're sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise as a pledge of our eternal inheritance. Right now we're in our mortal bodies, but we're guaranteed, a pledge, deposited. We all are guaranteed our resurrection body. Totally redeemed. God's own possession all because of the glory of God. All we did was accept what was done for us on the cross. Okay. <clears throat> There's that Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. So, salvation is not a view in this passage, but loss of fellowship with God is. Abiding in. If you don't abide in me, I won't abide in you.